Okay, have you had enough chance to think through your own worst nightmare and dream come true? That's God's will for your life, actually. What he's going to do is marry them. He's going to merge them in the last stage of your spiritual life. He'll be gradually doing it all along. But he'll merge them into one in the last stage of your spiritual life. And all along. The analogy is pretty kin to what most of us, at least in America, learn growing up as kids. We sit down to the dinner table in classic 1950s America. We all sat down at the dinner table. Tele television was off. The whole family sat together. This happened in millions and millions of homes in America. And the mother was usually, you know, freshly coiffed, quaffed, and had, her, you know, nice dress and shoes, pumps. She had her apron on to protect the dress. She was freshly made up. The husband, father was in some kind of suit. This doesn't sound like modern day America, so that's why I have to explain it all. The kids were in nice clothing, not necessarily suits. They sat very still at the table. They waited for the mother to finally put the dishes on the table, the serving dishes. She would take her apron off. She would sit at the other end of the table. The father sat at the head. And either the father, usually the father, or her would say grace. The kids would not move a muscle, would not reach for food or anything until that was done. And then, you can see this on sitcoms from the, the, the 1950s and 60s. And then the children would politely ask for certain foods to be passed. And in every household, there was at least one kid who didn't like certain vegetables that were served at dinner. This was so common a problem that it became a sort of aphorism in America. You cannot have your dessert until you've eaten your peas and carrots. Now, it wasn't necessarily peas and carrots the kids didn't like. More often it was broccoli or cauliflower. But it became a sort of expression in America that you couldn't have your dessert in this rather formal dinner setting. You couldn't have your dessert until you'd finished your peas and carrots because what the kids would do is they'd eat all the foods they liked first and generally speaking some, of, some vegetable or another was left sitting on the plate and they would say, oh I'm full now, I'm done. But no kid is ever too full for dessert. And dessert was always some kind of pie or cobbler or ice cream or usually both. And so the mother, generally speaking, would be saying to the child who didn't eat his vegetables, you cannot have your dessert until you've finished your peas and carrots. And if you wouldn't do that, you had to go to your room. Now, that sounds very quaint today. But that was how millions and millions and millions of America's, Americans lived in the 1950s and for the better part of the 1960s. Now here's the key phrase. You cannot have your dessert until you finish your peas and carrots. That's basically God's approach to this. The kid who finishes his peas and carrots thinks he did a good deed because he hated the peas and carrots and therefore he won or deserved or merited the dessert that he desperately wanted. But that's not really what's happening. The parents are teaching the children to match up what they don't like as a precondition to what they do want. 
you're learning cause and effect. But at a deeper level, at God's level, it's a juridical matching. The original guy who doesn't want anyone left behind is God. He wanted truth to be free and therefore all the low is ennobled by being included. He touches it all. And this is one of the lessons that I, that I have the hardest time learning, okay? If I touch it, it has a role. If I touch it, it has a value. God is out to lift everything up. No matter how wretched, no matter how small, no matter how ugly, no matter how horrible, that's why sins were imputed to Christ on the cross. This is the ultimate statement about God's philosophy. Technically speaking, as I've said many times before and you've heard me, God imputing sins to Christ on the cross didn't do a thing. He did it and then he pronounced us paid for. The whole human race. And from what I can tell in Hebrews 1 and 2, all the angels too. Because any sin is an offense against God. But technically speaking, the mechanics of what actually happened on the cross in Isaiah 53, God imputed the sins to Christ on the cross, stabbed him with them. Isaiah 53, 5, And then, per a contract that was made, I will make sons if you will be the substitute for sin. That's Isaiah 53, 10. Then God flat pronounces high, payment is made, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. There is no inherent connection between our sins and Christ. There is no inherent payment of our sins being imputed to Christ. If anything, it actually made the debt worse. God put sins on Christ. What is called a payment is a juridical, sovereign decision by Father because He just flat wants to call it that. Christ was willing to accept it. And while he was on the cross, he was thinking Bible doctrine, Isaiah 53, 11, Dato By means of his knowledge, he makes righteous. So the closest thing to a payment that you can say physically occurred on a cross is the thinking of Christ while he is receiving our sins. It is not receiving our sins that paid for them. It's Father pronouncing them paid that paid for them. Because Christ was thinking what Christ was thinking because he wanted to think it. It's what enabled him to keep saying yes to receiving our sins. But essentially Father pronounces as payment the reception of the sins. Because Christ said yes to that and they went into him. That's what Father calls the payment. Now if you think that over, it's like, what the? And then you have to think again. He is thinking while he's on the cross. He's thinking Bible doctrine. So on the one hand, there's no real payment, but instead of reception of sins, but on the other hand, he is thinking. And those thoughts wouldn't be there if the sins didn't go into him. He needed to think what he thought in order to keep on accepting. And the beauty that he would want to. And the beauty of the thoughts in his head while he's receiving our sins. That you could call payment. The trouble is I don't see really anywhere in scripture where it actually says that that particular part of it was the payment. He received, he became the substitute for sin. That's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He 
He who knew no sin, sin was made sin as a substitute for us. That's it. And then God flat pronounces us righteousness, righteous as a result. Same verse. It doesn't say God pronounces us righteous because of what he was thinking on the cross. The closest thing to that is Isaiah 53.11. By means of truth knowledge he makes righteous. Okay, but which truth knowledge? The truth knowledge of what he's thinking in reply to keep saying yes? Or the truth knowledge of the sins coming into him? Think about it. In either event, thinking Bible is what we're supposed to do. That alone pleases Father, Matthew 4.4 4, and Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11, 1. Both of those verses. It pleases him. So here you got your crosses of today coming into you. All the things you don't want. The peas and carrots. And the things you want that you want to, as a result of putting up with the taste of the peas and carrots you don't like. You want something you do like to result. And God pronounces a result that you will like. Your dream come true. If you eat your peas and carrots, take all, take your worst nightmare. Since being imputed to Christ was his worst nightmare. Then you get dessert. Your dream come true. His dream come true was to do for Father and save us. See the parallel? It is a juridical matching. It's not about deserving. We equate it with deserving because if there's a cause and effect, but the cause and effect is a juridical declaration by God. This is really important to get this in your head for what follows. God flat mates the two together as a juridical sovereign declaration. These shall be mated together. If the peas and the carrots, then the dessert. There is no inherent connection between the two. Sovereignty joins them because sovereignty wants to do so. There's no inherent connection between us and Christ. There's certainly no connection between our sins and Christ. But God said, If they go into him, I will pronounce salvation. I will pronounce the bill as paid. That That's a sovereign decision on his part. The sins could go into Christ and he doesn't have to say, okay, well this is going to result in salvation now. He could say something else. He could say nothing. It could have been just amongst the three of them and then we, you know, don't exist anymore. We don't deserve to be saved. The action on the cross did not warrant our being saved of itself. Because the sins didn't change. Christ didn't change. Well, actually, he grew bigger in his soul. You can't have all that horrible knowledge coming into your soul and not grow bigger. But there's no requirement that it be applied to us. God had to flat want that. Just out of thin air, he says, this is payment. Because it's what he chose it to be. He could have made a different choice. It's really, really important to understand. There is no inherent connection between our sins, going into Christ, and salvation. It's not inherent. It's juridical. God, in his sovereignty, decreed this will be the result because he wanted it to be. So the cause and effect, our sins going into Christ, therefore we're paid. That's a cause and effect, but it's solely a cause and effect because God says so. It's not native to anything. There's no affinity 
This is a theological term. There is no affinity between our sins and Christ's righteousness that this should result. It's just a flat, as we saw many times in episode 11, flat arbitrary love decree of God's period. Now the reason this is so important to understand is that in love on trial, the things you go through are your peas and carrots. And occasionally, afterwards, you get dessert. Or sometimes you get dessert before. And you're going to think, well, I shouldn't get dessert now. I haven't eaten my peas and carrots yet. Or you'll be thinking, I don't want to eat these peas and carrots. Or you'll be thinking, well, I ate the peas and carrots, therefore I deserve the dessert. None of those things are true. Peas and carrots are a vegetable. Dessert is sweet stuff, generally. There is no connection between the two. Closest thing would be if your dessert is made with vegetable oil. Generally speaking, dessert is not a vegetable of some kind. It might be a fruit, but not a vegetable. It's real important to understand because what's going to make what makes most Christians fall out, not finish, not finish the course, not get crowned, what makes most of them stop the Christian life, even though they're saved, is that the stuff that happens to them is so disconnected from what the Bible seems to say or what they expect God to be like or what they expect God to do. All the unbelievers in particular, sense this fundamental disconnect. I have to ask myself, if not more strongly than Christians. In some ways, the atheists perceive God better than we do. Because when they look at the Bible, it's just this big mishmash to them. The Bible stories, what it says, what it promises. Forget the science part, because un- the atheists don't understand science at all. Forget that. They have other objections, though, that are that are extremely um, apt. Why should one guy dying on a cross two thousand years ago pay for sins? How is that possible? Hmm? Fair, fair statement, fair question. And why should that pay for sins? In other words, hi, you can be an axe murderer, and you just believe Christ paid for your sins, and you're going to heaven, and you go right back to being an axe murderer again. Yeah. Well, that's a fundamental disconnect, isn't it? How can a righteous God allow that? Why would a righteous God invent a salvation plan like that? Even most Christians don't like it. They invent other conditions. You've got to be a good person. You can't commit mortal or you know mortal sins. You've got to repent, as if that did any good. You see the point? There's no connection between the salvation we get and, as it were, the peas and carrots that we eat. You eat the gospel. That means that's a metaphor in the Bible for believing it. And now all of a sudden you can do whatever you want? And you're still going to heaven? Yeah. Well, but where's the juridical connection? You see the point? Where is the cause and effect warranting, deserving, that we all spend our time on every day? Where where is it? It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem godly. What it seems like is a fairy tale. Now, we Christians get past that hurdle because we realize, well, there, there isn't anything you can do to warrant salvation. So if somebody's less moral than me, we're all below zero. And surely there's some other juridical effect to sin. Yeah, big ones. Like it encourages you to be negative to God so you don't grow up after salvation. And Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. When he says that murderers and liars won't inherit, inherit the kingdom of heaven. Which is kind of ironic considering it's Paul who's talking. 
because that's what Paul was, was a murderer and a liar. That was his job. That was why God blinded him on the Damascus Road. He was on his way to get Christians murdered. He had a writ of warrant going to Syria in order to murder Christians for being Christians, simply for being Christians. So Paul would know. Now in the Christian life, and it gets worse and worse as you age in Christ, in the Christian life, this is why the role play is going to end up being so important, you will face situations that are, have more and more and more of your worst nightmare in them, and less and less and less of your dream come true, until you embrace your worst nightmare. So just practice that now. What is my worst nightmare? I, you know, because we sort of covered this a little bit in episodes 8 and 11. What is my worst nightmare? Why? What is there? I, on what basis can I learn to love it? You can't learn to love it because it's attractive, because it won't be. It's not based on attraction. It's based on something else. And the mechanism that I find most useful is Father likes it. It pleases him. So that, that gives me a motive to do it. Otherwise I have none. And Father likes it because it's like the cross. You're going against. You're going toward you're going against your dream come true and toward your worst nightmare simply because he says so. There's no inherent connection. The thing that you don't want should not be wanted. It doesn't deserve you wanting it. Yeah, well, Christ didn't deserve to have our sins imputed to him. There was no reason to want those sins imputed to him. It's not a desirable thing under any circumstances whatsoever. In fact, you could argue the Father's statistic to do it to him. We covered that in episode 8 or 7. I forget which. There's no reason to want that. So you don't solve the problem of your worst nightmare by pretending to love it and find it attractive. No. You look it square in the face and say, I don't like this. Okay, so there has to be some other reason to go for it. Find the other reasons. One of the most helpful ones for me is, Dad likes it. Now, why does Dad like it? Well, gradually I'm learning the answer to that question. He, he doesn't like it for its own quality... He likes it for other reasons. In other words, there's nothing to like about sin. So it isn't related to their own intrinsic value. But you can want something that goes completely against you for other reasons. I mean, a whole lot of people hate their jobs. They would never pick those jobs, but they have to. And they take those jobs and they work hard at those jobs. Why? Because they want the money. They want something else. They don't love the job for its own sake. They love something that'll happen if they do it. Peas and carrots versus dessert. But it isn't a deserving. It's a juridical matchup. And that's really important to understand. It's a juridical matchup that's based on what could be called an arbitrary standard. God says A goes with B. Black goes with white. Red goes with blue. I mean, we all have standards about what colors fit together, especially in clothing. But those are all arbitrary standards, really. They're based on an aesthetic. But... 
you can't really call one color combination more just than another color combination. It's not, it's not real justice, it's a preference. God's preference is that low get matched to high. Bad get matched to good. That pleases him. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it pleases him. And that's what he's basically teaching each one of us in our lives. Is this ongoing matching of low to high. High to low. Bad to good. You know, it's typically said a lot of people say it too. Cross before crown. Peas and carrots before dessert. The trouble with us, in, as, with us humans is that we start, because we have sin natures, we start to equate the hard stuff we go through first to get the good stuff later. We, we tell ourselves, I deserve this good result. But the answer is no, we don't. So if you keep looking at cause and effect of stuff in your life, as a deserving question, you're going to be tied up in knots and you'll never finish maturity. You have to recognize that the two are entirely separate and the only reason they're joined together is because God flat wills itself. Otherwise you will never be able to grapple with life. I mean some people work really hard all their lives and they never get anything for it on this earth. And other people, they hardly work at all, and they get all kinds of benefits and goodies. And then, of course, more commonly, there are people who work really hard, and yeah, they do get lots of goodies as a result of working hard. You notice that, that that's a full spectrum? At the lower end of the spectrum, you got people who work and work and work and get nothing. At the upper end of the spectrum, you got people who do ha hardly any work at all, and they get everything. And in the middle, most people work hard and they get for what they work. But they don't deserve it in any point along the spectrum. It is not a deserving. The trouble with us as humans is we call it a deserving because the human, the sin nature is essentially an insecurity complex so it grabs on absolutely everything and tries to turn it into a deserving. And you'll just be tied up in knots. You'll never understand grace. You'll never understand what God's really doing. If you keep on thinking in terms of deserving. There's no deserving at all for anyone, anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Everything that's matched up in life, every seeming cause versus effect. At its most fundamental level, there's no deserving at all. Thing A happens, and as a result, thing B happens. And most of the time, especially when you get older, you start to say, whoa. But the thing that I did versus the thing that I got, the thing that I got shouldn't have resulted from the thing that I did. Exactly. All the really valuable stuff that we do in life is boring and ugly and low and slow and menial. And it has no benefit. The stuff that makes money in life is usually frivolous. And the stuff that ought to make money in life, that's really the most valuable upon which everything else depends, is usually low paid. Go figure. And a whole lot of people recognize that sometime during their lives. They say, there's no justice in life. Yeah, bingo. And that's where you start to get, you know, people start to get jealous or resentful. They look over at the other guy. The grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And the other guy didn't work as hard. And he's got more. How come? truth of the matter is, God knows what each soul needs. And one soul needs to work a lot harder 
to get the real benefit of learning out of it, and another soul doesn't need to work at all to get the benefit of learning out of it. It's just the way each soul works. And it really doesn't have anything to do with how hard you work and what you get. It has to do with what lessons you need to learn through the venue of what you're going through. Every single human being is on a training program. The training program for the unbeliever is basically kind of based on a what if. What if the believer believed, what if the unbeliever believed in Christ in the next minute? What did he need to learn that in that next minute, if he believed in Christ, would set him up for God's plan? And then, of course, as time passes, it gets harder and harder to provide him. God has a will for everybody's life. He made each person directly. He knows what decisions are going to be made in advance. And he has to orchestrate the whole thing, not only for justice for the sake of that person, by God's own definition of justice for that person. It's very personal. And when I say personal, I don't mean attractive personal. I mean personal related to the person. It's individual. Okay, he's got to orchestrate all those results and potentials with every other living human being. Not to mention all the people who've already died already and those yet to be born. Because every single action by every single person, however small and stupid, has a ripple effect throughout time. And it has to please God whatever it is he does with it. So he joins high to low. And I covered that back toward the end of episode 11. You turn on your shower... And if that were a good deed, it's not your good deed. Because hundreds of people were involved in building the bathroom, the tiles, shower head, the pipe, getting the water so that it would actually come up into the shower, so it would come out of the shower head, building the bathtub, building the foundation under the apartment or house or even two-room shack. Nothing you do is just yours, except what's in your head. So everything that happens to you is based on God foreknowing what is, could be, would be, won't be, might be, will be in your head. And for some people, the fastest way for them to learn a thing is to make them born rich. For other people, the fastest way for them to learn something is to make them born sick. Or get sick at an early age. You see what I'm trying to get at? The Romans had a, had a, a, a saying about this. I don't remember how the Latin goes. But in English, it's basically not all adversity comes to injure. I was tortured when I was 10. By human standards, I'm supposed to be upset about that. Oh, how could God let this happen to me? Honey, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I, I kind of even knew that at the time. Because I already knew God. See, he made sure I knew him early. Because he knew what was going to happen, what other people were going to do, and I would need that information about him in order to get through the crisis. And I actually benefited from it. I learned a lot from it, about him. I wouldn't take that back for all the tea in China. The only thing I'm sorry about is, you know, the, the effect it had on the people who did it to me, and the effect that it had, you know, on the people who were affected by it around me. Because they were all real upset about it. I wasn't. Not after it was over. So you see, bad things happen at different stages in your life for training. And the key is to ask God, okay, what training am I getting? Not bemoan the fact that you're poor or rich or sick or healthy or smart or dumb compared to somebody else. Because it isn't about comparing you to somebody else. 
Like Paul said, he just threw that at me. They who compare themselves by themselves are not wise. Everything about your life with God is vertical and, and individualized. If you get a lot of money tomorrow, there's a reason for it. Ask God why. If you suddenly are deprived of a lot of money tomorrow, if a tornado hits your house tomorrow, there's a reason. It's not about spanking you. It's not an index of whether you're a good or bad person. People aren't good because they get the things that humans value, and they're not bad because they lose them. Everything's about training in high and low. Like Paul said, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. That's the training program, teaching you how to be abased and how to be about. Not because you're supposed to sacrifice and do great things for God, that's not it at all. He wants you to understand why he matches high to low. He wants you to have the same mindset about it he has. So you can have fellowship with him in it. And, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble with that. Everybody has a lot of trouble with that. My particular kind of problem isn't like most people. I just, I have trouble f figuring out why God would want to create the low in order to baptize it with himself, you know, put himself in it and raise it up. When he didn't have to have the low exist in the first place. And his answer is always, I, I want to baptize all the points. Truth be free, I want to baptize all the points. I want to ennoble all the small things. So every time I do the dishes or something menial I'm supposed to practice, you know, the body needs it. And Isaiah 54, 1. That's my particular training program right now. You know, this year, next year, or year after that. He's got a similar specific set of ideas that you need to train in right now. Whatever it is, you got one kind of hickey in your spiritual life with God. That's foundational to your spiritual growth. You got to find out what it is. And then find out what kind of verses apply to it that you can rehearse while you're going through eating your peas and carrots so you can get to the dessert side. Not because of a deserving, but because of a matching that he's doing in his own personalized training program just for you. You are not equal to anyone else on the planet. There is no other person just like you. You are unique. You will always be unique. You have always been unique. You have one life down here born in a certain time frame to a certain family under certain circumstances with a certain future that, that God knows that you can elect against and it'll zig and zag and that's yours only yours I am not equal to you you're not equal to me and some things you're better, some things you're worse, some things I'm better, some things I'm worse. Spiritually, you could say the same thing, and it doesn't matter at all. See how he's undercutting Satan's plan? From the get-go, from the very moment he created your soul at birth, there's nobody like you. There's nothing about your life that's like everybody else. There will be superficial resemblances only. Your entire training program under him from the minute you're physically born is totally customized to you. Because he wants it that way. Now see, that's the maximum concept here to, to grasp. There's no such thing as deserving. The peas and carrots versus dessert connection is just like what your parents taught you if you were in 1950s America. They wanted to teach you that you need to do the thing that's right, whether you like it or not, and it was right to get nutrition, which is represented by the vegetables, irrespective of any gain. 
But as a child, they said, look, you get dessert as a result. Yeah, you did. But you didn't deserve the nutrition, and you didn't deserve the dessert. But you learn, if I do this bad thing, I'll get this good thing. Fundamentally, God's giving you the same kind of lesson. Because he wants to unite the bad thing and the good thing. And the way he's going to do it for you, and the way he's going to do it for anybody else, at most will have only a very shallow resemblance on the outside. Because each soul is, is its own on the inside. That's what's so pathetic to me. Is that everybody's living on hearsay. Instead of checking scripture to see what it really says. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian or whatever you are. Everybody's making all kinds of claims about God. And actually this is true for all the religions. And nobody's reading their holy books. And yet, each soul arguing, taking a position based on hearsay, not knowledge, based on what somebody else says, or consensus, or the opinions, uh, you know, of, of people. They don't know if those people know what they're talking about. We're selling our lives based on hearsay. In each one of our lives, there's nobody else like us. So why are we living other people's thoughts? Why are we banking our own lives on other people's ideas or claims? That that it's, it's like it's dumb. Yeah, you need teachers. Yeah, you need parents. Yeah, you have to, you know, go through a day where you can't just, you know, stop and study everything first for yourself. Okay, fine, but sooner or later in life, every single topic, especially the important ones like God, needs to be personally investigated. Otherwise, you live in somebody else's life, not your own. God's plan for your life is just for you. And what seems to happen to somebody else versus you, you have no idea what's really going on there. Like I said, in my case, I was tortured when I was 10 for two years. Anybody else hearing that? say, oh, what a terrible thing happened to brain out. Not really. And I'm the one it happened to, I should know. I learned a lot from it. So you see, it happened to me. Maybe if it happened, the same thing happened to somebody else, it wouldn't have worked. God works everything together for good, Romans 8, 28, honey, I know that story. In my own life. I saw him do it to me at an early age. And now you understand why I knew about God at an early age. I needed to. To get the benefit from it by the time the torture would occur. You see the point? So anybody hearing that story generically say, Oh, that's a terrible thing to happen. Not necessarily. You know, I'm trying not to be graphic and give you too many details. If I did, you'd think that, that, oh, you know, God is unfair and all that other nonsense. Everybody has a tragedy in his life. God means it to teach. Everybody has prosperity in his life. God means it to teach. Okay, so for you, what lesson is in the experience or the thing, bad or good, that you got, all the goodies you got now, all the goodies you lack now, all the bad stuff you got now, all the good stuff you got now, what is God doing with that? What's the lesson he wants to use? And you know that he means you to use Bible on it. Okay, what? What Bible? Use what way? What am I learning, Dad? I have to say that to him a thousand times a day because I keep forgetting. If you keep on doing that, 
knowing now what's your worst nightmare and your dream come true, knowing he's going to keep on playing ball back and forth between high and low, peas and carrots versus dessert, now you have a pretty, pretty good idea about what to expect for your life. And he'll throw you a curveball every time you think you've got it figured out. And he loves turning everything on his head. That's love on trial, too. The idea of uniting high and low. Christ, God, man, high to low. See that? Philippians 2, 5 through 10. That's what he's doing. This is why he's doing it. It's personally for each one of us, our own journey, no two alike, nobody equal because each one is unique. That's not a politically correct statement. We're not equal. We, there is higher and lower, but it doesn't matter that there's higher and lower. What matters is what lesson is God giving me today? And if you keep asking that question, then you'll learn God's will for your life on every single topic. Even what you eat for supper, brush your teeth, what do you wear. You can turn the whole thing into a learning game because that's what it is. And then if you think you're getting anal about it, then, you know, slack off. Think that over. Everything in your life is, is a venue for a lesson from God. Just for you. Keyed to you. Your soul working your soul's way. Well then what lesson is it? Doesn't matter how bad. Doesn't matter how good. It's not about deserving. It's not about you being a good or bad person. It's about learning Him. Learning how He wants high to low being made of peas and carrots and dessert. Cross and crown. Especially for you. What is the lesson for you today? If you ask yourself one question. If you ask God one question. Keep asking him. What am I learning, Dad? You'll be amazed at how if you keep on doing this for like a month you'll be amazed at how you will revalue the meaning of your life and then you'll come closer to understanding what this episode 12 is going to mean about love on trial peace out